the Australian Institute of Physics, the Teachers Guild of New South Wales, and the Royal Australian Chemical Institute acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia. We recognise their continuing connection to the traditional lands and waters and would like to pay respects to their elders past and present. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr. Frederick Osmond. As the President of the Teachers Guild of New South Wales and also the Secretary of the New South Wales Australian Institute of Physics, I'm pleased to welcome you this evening at the Concord Golf Club for our 2021 the Frontiers of Science Forum presented by the Australian Institute of Physics, the Teachers Guild of New South Wales and the Royal Australian Chemical Institute. Tonight, we are privileged to be joined by Australia's ninth Chief Scientist, Dr Cathy Foley, along with Professor Judith Dawes, Dr Daniel Mansfield, Professor Antoine Van Ogen, and Dr Marcus Moller as speakers at this year's combined Frontiers of Science Forum event. I would also like to thank in advance our panel this evening, along with Ian Wolfe from Diffusion Radio, who will be involved with our panel discussion later this evening on exploring major discoveries and theories in physics, mathematics, biology, and chemistry. The format of this evening will be our presenters to speak for 25 minutes each on their chosen topics, and this will uh, conclude with a panel discussion and Q&A at the end. So please hold those questions to the panel discussion. On behalf of the Australian Institute of Physics, the Teachers Guild of New South Wales and the Royal Australian Chemical Institute members, I'd like to extend our hearty congratulations to Dr Cathy Foley's appointment as Australia's ninth Chief Scientist who commenced in January 2021. We are thrilled to see a highly accomplished scientist and a renowned physicist appointed to this very important role after a lengthy career at Australia's National Science Agency, the CSIRO. She was appointed as the agency chief scientist in August 2018, the second woman to hold that role. Dr Foley's career in physics began with her PhD at Macquarie University on the semiconductor indium nitride. She and her colleagues were one of the first groups to carry out pioneering research that examined the properties of indium nitride in light sensitive devices. The best known applications being white light emitting diodes used for household low energy lighting. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Cathy Foley to open the proceedings as the Chief Scientist of Australia. Hi everyone, it's really great to be here and I thought this was a great opportunity to begin by looking at going back to the future as we come to the end of the COVID pandemic or we hope we are coming to the end of the COVID pandemic. But I also would like to pay respects to Elders past and present and also if there are any Indigenous people in the audience tonight I just want to say um, my great respect to you. I, I guess I'd like to draw attention to, I normally have a picture of this, but I, I forgot to put it in, of the, um, the Rewarana fish traps up in northern New South Wales, which are the oldest engineered system in the world, 20,000 years old, and they were operational until 1966 when a weir was built just further up. And, uh, and it just shows that we have much to learn from them, particularly with Indigenous knowledge, and they were the first scientists in Australia and in the world. So what I want to talk about today is uh, how we work and how work is changing. And I, the reason I want to touch on this is that if you go back to how we have done work in the past, basically a researcher normally works in their lab using specialised equipment, and then they get their data, they analyze it, and then we had that as just the normal way. Write a paper, maybe take it to a commercial outcome on a very rare occasion. But last year we saw COVID hit us, and it's really interesting to see how we've been able to have quite an amazing response to that. By the way, research has continued to be undertaken. And in this case, what it's shown is that we've been able to come from our bedrooms or lounge rooms or dining rooms with a computer, being able to use different pieces of equipment, different uh, capabilities around the country where particularly 
uh, uh, for example, the Australian National Fabrication Facility, one I know well in Melbourne, uh, was still operational. They were still able to make materials to design of people who are users. Then send that, that particular sample of material they made to a place to be measured, and then get the data, and then be able to do exactly the same science without leaving their bedroom. So this has really meant that during the pandemic, we've really changed the way we operate. And I guess one of the things I want to, I'm wondering about what will the future look like? And I'll draw your attention to this movie back in, um, I don't know when it was, the 1980s or, and they were projecting into the future where, what is it, Marty McFly went back to 2015. And remember there were hoverboards and a whole lot of things like that, thinking about what the world was like. We went past 2015, didn't even notice that it was nowhere like that. But what we are wondering is what will the world be like in the next five, ten years. What is it that's going to be a consequence of us experiencing COVID and really in a very disruptive way rethinking the way we work? So what I want to do is um, look at this a little bit more and just go through looking at what is possible because of COVID when we think of it in terms of changing the way we work. So I want to look at what I think are some of the benefits that science has had. And the first one is equity. The thing that's really interesting is that you can be a person with a computer and an internet connection and actually be able to do your work anywhere. Imagine if you were able to do that in remote New South Wales or in a Pacific island or in Papua New Guinea. Suddenly, research and quite complex research is potentially available to everyone. And so this is something which is really different. The next thing is then there's the potential for exposure to a whole range of pieces of equipment. I think the ANCRIS program where they're going to be this year um, redoing the roadmap is going to be a really important change for us. Thinking about instead of us all having our own piece of equipment where we do something probably substandard because we didn't quite have enough money to be able to get the top of the line thing. What if when we club together and we have major pieces of world class equipment, the last ANCRIS program really showed that to be fantastic and I think physics has shown the way of how you can do that well. What if you were to do this so that suddenly you're able to have world class, world, you know, world leading access which anyone can use by just being able to either book it and go through whatever process there is. We've got examples from that already with the synchrotron, with um, the Opal reactor, not to mention ANFF, radio telescopes and so on. But then the other thing I want to raise is that what we're also seeing at the moment is the beginning of a quantum revolution. And I want to draw this out particularly with this audience because everyone at the moment is thinking, oh, quantum computers, they're still a way off, you know, I'm going to be waiting. But actually they're here now. And I want to draw your attention to the IBM quantum computing portal, which allows you to get access to their, I think it's 50 or 60 qubit computer, which is interesting to see their business model. What they've done is, you might have thought of it as just being a toy, but what they've done is link, made this available to anyone who can go through this portal to be able to get on and have a go at developing new applications. And what they have found by linking it on to a classical computer, that they're already seeing um, 300,000 people in the last 12 months come onto that platform, 20,000 new applications being developed, and people are able to do th um, three things already. One is they're able to do quantum calculations. They just can't do on a, cal on a, on a classical computer. But just with this uh, 50 or 60 qubit quantum computer, with a, 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 a high performance computer, suddenly you can. Uh, it's limited, but still improved on what's possible with a classical computer. So the second thing is you're able to do a, um, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, and do, uh, I guess, analyses which are over and above what you can do with a classical computer. And then finally, with search algorithms, you're again able to break through and do things again which you can't just do classically. So this is something which is showing us the potential is huge and every one of us needs to be thinking about how can we become quantum literate before we have the full error corrected computers coming available. available. And we're seeing already enormous investment in countries all around the world um, Australia has investment in that and we've had a long history and some fantastic um, research here. We're seeing startup companies coming. We're seeing, um, that, for example, government investment in, into the silicon quantum computer at University of New South Wales. 
The next thing is also the ability, I guess, for automation, robotics, and machine learning to allow us to push those boundaries. And I want to give an example here, looking at, um, again, a mixture of the potential high-performance computing and new systems of measurement. So what you're looking at here is the Australia Telescope in 2009. And it was looking at the, um, what you're looking at there is Centurus A galaxy. And it took uh, astronomers, uh, what was it, 1,200 hours to collect the data, and then um, 10,000 hours of computing to be able to get that map. Let's go forward to, um, I think it was about ten, uh, a couple of years ago with the ASCAP when it came online, and with com combination with the Pawsey uh, uh, supercomputer over in Perth, they were able to do the whole thing in 10 minutes. So this is the, the impact of the power of both improved instrumentation and also high performance computing. So imagine what's going to happen when we put a quantum overlay <coughs> on top of that. The next thing I want to look at then is, um, is the ability for um, uh, and the opportunity to collaborate. COVID has allowed us to actually reach out, and this is, you know, I think in the last week I have done more face-to-face -face talks than I have done in my previous 12 months. And before that, I um, was spending most of my day doing web, web presentations. And they actually weren't too bad. I, I made lots of contacts and, and good friendships with people I still have not met. I don't know if they're tall, short, got legs, you know, <laughs> and so it's something where I, you can still make those relationships. In fact, um, I was trying to find a good scientific thing, but this is my Joey Scout group. We were able to run Joey Scouts the whole time through the COVID lockdown. You can see it was Easter time and we were making toilet roll bunnies but with goggly eyes. But the thing was really interesting was how I was able to bring in, I accidentally deleted the picture, I was able to get Paul Scully Power to come and join our, our Joey Scout group because it said, it's you know, 15 minutes, Paul, please. We went, oh, I don't know when we do things like that. But suddenly, these kids were having access to that. I asked um, um, Brian Schmidt if he could join in as a Nobel Prize winner. Kids winning, yes, because it's easy. 10 minutes for someone really important. I was um, heading towards asking, um, asking our, our local member, but then the COVID restrictions ended, and of course, we went back into the scout hall. But that was for kids being able to access things. But what about all of us, or, or people who are in um, not necessarily the best university or the best school or in remote, remote areas? Suddenly, we can bring everyone together. And of course, we don't want to do it all the time. Seeing people in 3D, having those things are possible. I'll touch on that in a minute. Because that's, I guess, what, what we have to think about is all the good things, but as I mentioned, there'll be some challenges. And I suppose the first one is that we don't have that you know, human thing where you get a feeling first, someone's a bit tired, and instead of going off and you know, putting their picture up or going black on, on, the, um, on their screen, you actually can see where the people are, are uncomfortable, and so therefore you know it's time to move on and to end your talk. Or it might be uh, some way of actually getting that, um, the, that human interaction so that you can create a, a deeper bond. So I'm not going to say that that um, personal contact is not important, it is, but can we have somewhere in between? The next thing is the importance of networking. And it was really interesting uh, giving lots of talks last year to early career researchers who weren't able to go to conferences, or if they were going to conferences, how can they actually find their next job when uh, conferences are the place to meet? I mean, I know from my, from my situation, that all my um, opportunities in my career often came from going to a conference. So, so how can you turn that experience from something that into something that is virtual? And it's actually rethinking how you do science or how you do your networking. And I went through, um, it's probably a talk for another day, going through making a list of handy hints on how to follow up on a virtual meeting, because there are ways of doing it. It's very tempting when you go to a virtual conference, and we still have virtual conferences for at least the next 12 months. It's really easy to just, oh, I'll just go to that talk or that session I'm interested in, and the rest I won't bother, bother about. But as researchers, particularly senior people, I think it's really important that we engage in the coffee roulettes, or that we get onto the chat sessions, and that we fully engage dig digitally in, in these international conferences. Maybe not for ourselves, but for our early career researchers. Because this is how, in this current climate, in this COVID period of time, that we're going to support them to be able to find their careers and their pathways. 
And I guess the final thing too is um, going through looking at um, how we can make sure that the technology that we, we need is the right technology. How can we make sure that which we're, as a collective, getting the right balance between what you need to do with hands-on, so that we know hands-on. I think someone was saying that we need to get back into the lab and be able to do more hands-on and face-to-face. -face -face. But how can we get the balance right? What is it that we should be doing, particularly in Australia, so we don't have a whole thin layer of you know, the classic Vegemite effect across Australia, that we have a little bit of everything that's substandard. But instead, can we actually decide to have a few areas which we're going to research and their focus areas and priorities, and we really make as a nation an enormous big impact. Can we actually lean into that discomfort of sharing, clubbing together, and, and coming up with something which really is going to make the difference? And I think the astronomers are a good way of looking at how you can do that. They have been able to get to a point where I'm amazed in the department of which I'm in, in, in my new job, is, um, has a whole section on, the, on astronomy, and they even have, um, um, an astronomer on, on staff and things like that, which I just had no idea because they're so organised. So, look, I think it's a brave new world and we're, we've got something to really think about. But I guess I just want to go into a little bit more detail about how I actually think <coughs> science is going to change at that level. Can I go for time? Uh, huh? Okay. So the first thing is, we're going to see a lot changing, and science, the way we do it, is going to change from animal testing to organs on a chip. We're going to see genome foundries um, having, uh, uh, leading to cultural and um, artificial tissue. We're going to have wet labs being um, something you do at the very end, so chemistry will be done in a computer a lot before you actually go into a laboratory. We're going to see data visualization, which is going to allow us to um, have some sort of brain-computer interface so that we're able to understand what this complex information looks like. We're already seeing, instead of going out and just doing zillions of field trials, that we're seeing in-field, um, hi-fi, ubiquitous sensors, as well as remote sensing from satellites. And then, of course, in order to get all this data, we have to have supercomputers, which we've seen already, uh, the PAUSI, uh, uh, supercomputer and also the, N, um, the NCI computer is it? In, um, at ANU, they're in the process of being upgraded now. And so with that, we're, we've got all these, I guess, new ways of working, which will allow us to do science in a different way. I also think the ecosystem of science and technology is going to be changing as well. So what we're working towards is open science, data sharing co and cooperation. So that instead of us, and I know I've got plenty of it in my, my, um, my share drive, is a whole lot of Excel spreadsheets with lots of data and things, which no one else gets to use and might be actually valuable if we were able to make it open access. When it's data is curated in a way and put into, say, a, a managed data ecosystem. And then having that cooperation between groups to be able to take our data and every experiment goes further than we've done it in the past. The other idea is also to have open innovation where instead of having the whole swag of different problems, which we still have to have some of that, and I don't want, to, want you to think that we're diminishing the idea of having inventive, creative new ideas coming from an individual, having deep thought and showing their brilliance. But there is also room for us to have co-creation and challenge models, such as, and I'll put one out there, the government is desperate to work out how can we measure carbon in soil so that we can actually go and have a sensible way to measure carbon capture in soil and then have it in a way which can be regulated or uh, standardised so that then we know for carbon capture which will be necessary to have net zero emissions. That is a big gap. So can we put out a challenge model there and say to the community, to you, saying how can we solve this problem and so teams come together to see if they can come up with working on a common um, issue. But the problem is, how do you have re recognition and reward? Where tokenization, which is not you know, token woman in meeting, this is actually about going through and collecting and understanding of uh, sort of like um, provenance. Where did the information come from? Who is um, who contributed to it? What were uh, what is the way of sharing out the spoils when something's successful? And then, of course, peer review and publication is something where I'm looking to work working towards open access to make sure that we actually have 
all literature which is publicly uh, and, and information and science that is created by the public purse is open to everyone. But also we're looking at a whole new way of, um, of making sure that we have the best quality peer review, especially if those of us involved with in, um, the journal process will know that it gets getting more and more challenging to find people who are actually uh, willing to referee a paper. So I mentioned already artificial intelligence, machine learning and quantum information. And I just want to quickly go through and just explain what I mean by that. So this is made up of several parts. The first one is the data platforms where we have to ha make sure we have that data ecosystem. The next thing is we have to go through and be able to have the algorithms that can pull out the feature extraction. And then the next is actually using that feature extraction to be able to learn something from it and turn it into knowledge. And then from that, be able to have a model that is informed by artificial intelligence and allows us to enhance our predictions. But to be able to do that, we need to make sure that we have the ethics, responsible research, robustness, causality, explainability. I don't think this is an audience I need to talk too much about with the second quantum revolution. But quantum has the potential, I won't go into the details here, of a whole swag of impacts in a whole lot of different areas. And I just want to point to some of them already. And I'm probably harboring and laboring this, but I think that uh, a lot of people think that things quantum are just something that you do in quantum labs in physics departments. Already we're seeing at ANU, they, they've got their NV diamond um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, qubits at quantum accelerator being working with the Pawsey supercomputer and by April they're going to actually have an, an attachment to that so that they're going to have a quantum accelerator on the Pawsey supercomputer. So again a bit like the model that they have with IBM, you'll be able to get on there and have a play and see what more you can do with it. In, at Melbourne University, uh, Lloyd Hollingberg with um, I think also the Pawsey supercomputer has been able to do simulations and uh, some of the best simulations um, internationally on um, trying to um, going through and looking at quantum systems. And I've mentioned IBM already, but you can, if you have no idea even where to start, you can go onto the quizkit.org website and it will actually give you free lessons to be able to get in there and learn that. And in Q Control, which is Michael Beerchek's co um, company, spin out from Sydney University, you can do the same thing where you can go onto his, um, his, his website and learn all about how to adopt quantum technologies in your research. Now, we know that, for example, um, technology comes along and, um, and I want to point out that it does change when you have the right technology that people want with the right business model and the regulations and things in place. And this is a really good example. This is 2005 when people went to see the Pope. You can see there, they're just doing their nice religious things, praying. Okay, let's go a few years into the future. And this is how people feel or, or operate, is that how many of you can go anywhere without your mobile phone and you actually live your life through that. In that short space of time, what a difference. And then the next thing, I guess, just to summarize, is that I think the future of science is gonna be more data driven, that we're going to be augmented, both the interfaces and intelligence. The complex tasks are going to be automated. We're going to have a whole range of new tools. And we're going to see the publications are going to be something where we're going to use formats which are machine readable, so that we're going to be able to use complex computer reasoning to be able to even draw up more information. Oops, sorry, there we go. OK, now just to finish off, this is something which I think we need to remember, and that is that diversity is important. And when we all talk about diversity, it's a whole range of different things. Because it's the International um, Women's Day week, this week, I thought I'd just focus on females. <coughs> and the reason I want to raise this is that when we get diversity right, we've got lots of benefits. And this is just from a business perspective, because no one's done it for science, but I reckon it's going to be pretty similar. So, for example, if we were to close the gender gap in Australia, we would boost the GDP by 11%. If we increase the same level of female participation in the workforce as Canada did, it would be a growth of $25 billion. If we increase the number of women in leadership positions and economic um, activity would boost by 20%. And the flow and effects to the economy are phenomenal because you'd have reduced pension costs, you'd have increased household savings and, of course, tax revenues is more money to put into research. And, and then for our organisations, 
there's skills shortages which are an issue. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to, uh, um, to hire a technical staff member who knows all about cryogenics. We can get lots of air conditioning, um, uh, air conditioning technicians, but we need to go a bit cooler. And that's because we just aren't training people in the right areas where the opportunities are. Where, and Australia ranks fourth in talent shortage in the world. So if you actually have gender equity, you start seeing things like customer satisfaction going up. You see productivity going up. You see profitability going up. And you also see the performance of, your, of things like um, return on sales and equity and capital investment. Now I know this is for business, but it's not going to be too different from, the, from science too because they're sort of the same sort of thinking. So you know, basically I think that we've got this great opportunity and COVID has shown us, and I'm probably running out of time, but COVID has showed us that we can do this because we've had fundamental science and we also had uh, uh, the ability to do vaccine development. We also had the investment in infrastructure so that we had specialised um, equipment which we could scale up. We also had incredible collaboration nationally and internationally. We've had diversity in the approach in which everything was undertaken, uh, regardless of what country work was done. The data, for example, all the 76,000 COVID papers that have been published in the last 12 months have been accessible to everybody, and also it's been timely, and all the databases of information have been available. And so as a consequence, we've seen pharmaceutical companies, medical manufacturers, all be able to deliver a vaccine in, <coughs> at a speed that's never been seen before, not because of any miracle, it's all because of having had the system work properly. And underneath all that, you've got the government regulation pulling it all together. We've done that with COVID, so why don't we do it with every other aspect of the research that we do? So just to finish off, the way we work is changing. I want you to watch out for quantum, and I re especially with this community here, that really see what you can do to embrace it and see how it can really change your research. Diversity is critical, and look what happens when we pull it all together, because we achieve that with quantum. So thanks very much. multidisciplinary and I hope that it will appeal to a number of different um, areas. So I'm going to talk about sensing with nanoparticles in random lasers and I show you first an artist's impression of some nanoparticles that have uh, different colours, different sizes and different crystal phases but they are roughly those shapes and they are roughly those colours. The, the crystal phase are different forms of the same chemical composition, but they do in fact emit at quite different wavelengths and with different lifetimes. So nanoparticles can be really intriguing. Now, um, I want to start by saying what's so special about nanoparticles? And it's because they're all surface and no volume. That's why they're interesting because the nanoparticle is the same chemical composition as the thing that you're making it from. But the chemical composition of the thing you're making it from, usually the bulk properties define the properties of the particles, of, of the substance. But when you make nanoparticles, it's all surface. So what does that do? It means that there's a lot of atoms on the surface that are not surrounded by they're friends from the rest of the substance. They're surrounded by the environment. They can probe the environment. They're sensitive to the environment. Maybe they've got dangling bonds. They're going to stick to whatever they're next to or associate. <coughs> so the, the surface properties really drive the behavior of the nanoparticles. And that can mean that they are soluble. If I give you a chunk of ruby and say, put it in water, you're going to say, well, that's not going to dissolve. But if I give you a little 
sample of nano rubies, I can mix it with water and it, it becomes a colloidal solution and it stays in suspension for months. So the nanoparticles have different properties. Um, they can also um, aid things like catalysis. So they're very, the function of those nanoparticles is quite important because by having all that surface area, you can start to interact with chemicals. You can make those chemical links. And so you can make a catalyst that's much more efficient. Um, you can also bring those little nanoparticles into cells and you can do stuff with them inside the cells. For example, there is a laser, uh, a, a cancer treatment in which gold nanoparticles are introduced into cancer cells and when you irradiate them, they heat up locally, very locally, and kill the cells. So, so you can do things with nanoparticles that you can't imagine doing with the bulk substance. They're really interesting and very versatile. And the surface area of the nanoparticles is much, much greater than the corresponding volume or mass. So I can give you a tiny sample of nanodiamonds or nanorubies or nanogold. I've got expensive tastes. Um, <laughs> but honestly, they're not going to look like anything. You know, you're not going to be impressed by them because they're just going to be in solution and you, you're hardly going to be able to see them. So it's, it's actually interesting that, that the, the, the amount of stuff you've got is, is really quite relatively small. So now I want to think about how light interacts with the nanoparticles. And you're familiar with some aspects of this because light scatters from particles. Now, this image on the left is an extreme example of that. The light scattered from the dust during the Sydney dust storms, and that is the Harbour Bridge. And that is during the day, and that is a dust storm. That was an extreme dust storm. But it's the same effect that you get at sunset. Light going through the atmosphere scatters off the dust and, the, and, and to some extent the molecules in the atmosphere. And the blue light, the short wavelength light, scatters more. The red light's what's left. So you see the red light coming to, coming to your eye. And so that's why a sunset looks red-orange, because the blue-green light has been scattered. Um, in addition to scattering, nanoparticles can also absorb and emit light. So the top right image is of some semiconductor nanoparticles, aka quantum dots. Now those particular ones are cadmium selenide shell with a zinc sulfide core. So they've got a double layer, and it's two different semiconductors, but they're still very small. Subtle differences in the size change the colour. Subtle differences in the chemical composition, the ratio of the, of the two substances, also change the colour. Um, they're stable in solution, they just stay there. And they're all being illuminated by probably UV to give them that really lovely bright colour. But, so you've got light coming in to give them the nice emission. But they also will absorb light, so that might be a feature you want. Those ones are probably toxic, just as a solid, but yeah, whatever. Um, <coughs> the other thing you can do is to, is to use metallic nanoparticles. So gold and silver are quite widely used as metallic nanoparticles. And they absorb and they will also emit in subtle ways. So the image on the bottom right is of the Lycurgus cup, which is an ancient Roman cup, glass cup. And when you illuminate it from the front, you just have the light coming from the front and you look at the reflected light, it looks greenish, olive green. When you illuminate it from the inside or from the back, it looks red. And that's gold nanoparticles mixed in with the glass. And there was also another aspect of this in some of the ancient stained glass windows in, in churches, that they're also using gold nanoparticles. Now, they didn't call themselves nanotechnologists, but they were using gold as one of the ways to change the colour of the glass. And by controlling the size of the gold particles, you change the colour. And so nanoparticles are really versatile. So now I want to tell you a little bit about ruby nanoparticles and some applications of ruby nanoparticles in cells for imaging. So um, if we start with <coughs> ruby, and we grind it up, we get uh, the image on the right, which is a transmission electron microscope image of ruby. And you can see it's, it's, it's a bit ratty, it's sort of 
there's a fair bit of variation in the size. The average size is about 100 nanometers. Um, there's actually a mixture of zirconia in there with the ruby. The way that happened was that the way we made these, which I'll show you in a minute, was that we ground them up with zirconia um, balls, basically. They they're ground up with zirconia balls and shaken. And that leaves a bit of zirconia in there, which we have to wash out. Um, the features of ruby that make it so special are that it's got broad visible absorption, so you can put light into the material, you can excite the material fairly easily using you know, accessible light sources. And it's got quite a narrow line with emission in the deep red. It's visible, but it's only just. And it's also got a long emission lifetime. So those were some of the properties that made ruby an ideal substance to make the first laser with. So uh, the first laser was made in 1960 and it was made with ruby crystals. And so ruby is actually um, a material that's close to the hearts of many laser people. So how do you do this? You take a piece of ruby and you put it in this barbaric looking machine in the basement of the geology building that grinds rocks. And so you just go crunch <laughs> and, and you sort of wince. And so they did that and then they kept grinding. And then you put it through what's called a ball mill, which is sort of like a big washing machine for hours. And so these ruby crystals are getting ground up. And so they start off in that, that lovely dark red and they end up looking sort of pinkish. And that's still ruby, but it's so small that it's now scattering the light at all wavelengths. And so it's scattering the light to you and it just looks white because it's scattering the light. But then you have to sort of wash it, you sieve it, you wash it again, you centrifuge it, you wash it with acid, you wash it with alkali, you wash it with acid and you centrifuge it. And you end up getting particles that are fairly uniform in size. They're a little bit rounder than the ones that I showed you first. And then, that's the ones on the top left, <coughs> and then you do things with them. So they're now nanorubies. And what do you do with them? Well, we were interested in using them to label cells. So what we wanted to do was we, uh, this is a multidisciplinary team I might add, there are people there who can grow cell cultures, there are people there who can do biochemistry, and there are people there who can work on the materials and the optics. So this is a multidisciplinary team. Um, so we coated the, the nanorubies with silica, and a silica coating enables the nanoruby to then be labelled with an antibody, uh, um, a protein type antibody or a biomarker. Those particles can be coated with different antibodies, and they can be attached to different antibodies, and then you can introduce them into a cell culture. And this is a cell culture of mouse pituitary tumor cells, um, which obviously has been cultured for this purpose. Um, and you can see that when you bring the cell, bring the particles close to the cells, if they have the right antibodies, they will get taken up by the cells and they will bind to the receptors on those cells that match the antibody we're looking for. And so we're interested in, do they map to particular kinds of opioid receptors that, that was part of the study that they were doing? And so when you illuminate the cells with these rubies, they light up where the receptors are because that's where they're bound to the cell membrane or inside the cell. And so that's the concept here, that you can use the rubies as a really bright, um, uh, beacon of where in the cell is the interesting stuff happening and that was the idea of this and <coughs> the other thing on the bottom left you can see is a lifetime plot and that's plotted on a log linear scale so it's 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 more or less a single exponential decay lifetime so when you excite the rubies they decay with a, um, a characteristic lifetime of around three milliseconds which is quite long most things that you excite will have a lifetime that's much shorter than that, more like nanoseconds. So this millisecond lifetime is quite long and that's quite useful. Um, but it's a bit tunable and it, it's dependent on the concentration of chromium inside the ruby. Chromium is the thing that makes it colour. 
So that's quite useful. Um, <coughs> so then we took those different coloured rubies, each of which had a characteristic lifetime, and we attached them to different biomarkers. And we could then identify how those biomarkers were distributed in particular kinds of cells. This is then shown at the top, you've got what's a bright blue <coughs> image of the cells. At the bottom, you've got what's um, it's been artificially coloured, so it's a pseudo colour image. It should be monochrome, but it's a pseudo colour image of the different labelled cells. So this enables you to see features inside the cells based on what the ruby is binding to. So that's the idea of that. And I can't tell you much about the cells except that they're now true true supergenic cells. So um, <coughs> now I'd like to talk to you about the advantage of going to collective effects of nanoparticles. So far, we've looked at each of these nanoparticles effectively as a particle on its own. We might put a bunch of them in the cell, that'll make it brighter, but each particle is doing its thing independently of the other particles. If we can make them work collectively, we can amplify the signal. And that's what we've done in the next part. So we've worked with a random laser. So I first want to explain what a random laser is. So what's a regular laser? What's a standard laser? So we start with a, a, a gain material or an optical amplifying medium. And that optically amplifying medium has to have energy put into it. So what's an optically amplifying medium? Ruby. But there's others. There's um, dye lasers. There's different kinds of dyes like rhodamine. There's um, garnets. There's gas lasers like nitrogen or carbon dioxide or helium neon. So there's different kinds of gain materials which will then govern the wavelengths of the light that's emitted by the laser. Um, you put energy into the gain material and then it emits light in all directions. The light that goes between the two mirrors, so I've got two mirrors going backwards and forwards, and the light that is reflected between the two mirrors will get amplified. Every time it goes through the gain material, it will get amplified a bit more. It might do 100 passes or 1,000 passes through the gain material, and each time it gets amplified. The light that goes sideways or out doesn't get amplified, so it doesn't build up. So it's only the one that goes between the two mirrors that gets built up. And then a little bit of it leaks out this right-hand mirror because it's a partially reflecting <coughs> So it's partially silver. Okay? And so a bit leaks out. That's our beam. That's our laser beam. That's how a regular laser works. Now I take away the mirrors. And I go, okay, let's take our gain material and let's put scattering particles into it. And the light still moves inside the gain material, but every time it hits a scattering particle, it bounces back and it returns back. And so it increases its path length in the gain material just the same way as it did between the two mirrors. And so it can still amplify inside this scattering material. And that's what a random laser does. But <coughs> it's... Um, it's partially coherent. It's not completely coherent the way a typical laser would be. It does show a, a threshold. This is an example of an um, input power versus output detector power. And you do see evidence of a threshold here, which is usually we would take as a signature for lasing. So we do see a threshold, but it's partially coherent. But there's no mirrors. It's the weirdest thing. There's no beam either. It's glowing. It's bright. It's very bright, but it's glowing. It's not a beam. So it's a really weird structure. And it, it and the first ideas around random lasers were definitely, it's a curiosity. Wow, it's cool. You know, for a physicist who plays with lasers, it's super cool. Is it useful? Mm, don't know. Anyway, um, how can you make a random laser? Here's an example that somebody else did. They took a cellulose sheet, so that's like a piece of paper and they impregnated it with dye, and then they let it dry, and then they illuminated it, and below threshold, it glows a bit. Above threshold, it lasers. So it, you can make lasers out of all sorts of things. You can make lasers out of milk with dye added, pink milk, basically. You can just excite the, the dye inside the milk, 
the light scatters off all the little milk globules, the, the fat globules in the milk, and it behaves like a random laser. That's been published, by the way, um, <coughs> as a way of measuring the amount of fat in the milk. So um, you can also make a random laser out of a cancer tumour, and you can see that the characteristics of the emission are different, whether it's a cancer tumour or, or normal tissue. So it's really quite diverse. So you can also make random lasers out of slightly disordered materials or very disordered materials. The level of disorder is, is um, quite, quite loose. We do need enough laser gain, so we do need enough amplification of the light, and we need a strong refractive index contrast to allow that scattering effect to work. So um, here's an example of one of our first experiments, and for the teachers in the room, I just thought this was nice. This is the classic Young's double slit experiment. This is it. And we studied the coherence of our laser output using Young's double slit experiment. So we excited the sample of dye with particles using an ex excitation laser, which was a neodymium YAG laser, which was frequency double to the green. And then we collected the emission from the random laser and we imaged that onto a double slit and then we looked at the fringe pattern that, that arose. And below threshold, nothing much happens. Above threshold, you see fringes. And so you see evidence of coherence evolving as the fringe pattern builds and it's a function of the threshold. And then you compare that. So here we have fringe, pa fringe pattern visibility for three different concentrations of particles, but just let's just pick the blue ones. So if we look at the blue ones, there's a pattern that looks like that. And the fringe pattern visibility jumps here, just below 40. Here is the blue one here. This is the input-output curve for the laser threshold. And it jumps just below 40. So the threshold behavior of the laser in terms of its intensity matches the coherence. So it behaves like a laser. It's weird though but it does behave like a laser. So it's kind of intriguing. Now we put ruby into this material, and we use ruby particles, and we get the excitation and the fluorescence, and they do the kinds of things you expect them to do. So you excite them in the blue-green, and then you emit around the, the deep red, and the amount of emission depends on how much chromium you've got. They all make sense, that's okay. And then you look at the threshold, and if you've got lots of chromium, the threshold is quite low because you've got the ability to absorb the energy much more efficiently. If you don't have so much chromium, the threshold's a bit higher. It's a little bit higher to, harder to make a blaze. So Ruby behaves like a random laser. So that was kind of cool. Um, it was about satisfying. Now I just want to show you this just because it's cute. This is a totally different thing, but it is cute. These are diamond nano needles. So take a piece of diamond, put it into a plasma etcher and zap it really hard. And if you get the conditions right, it doesn't just ablate, it actually ablates in, in pillars. And so they look like that picture. So you get little pillars of diamond growing out of the substrate. Now we just put a little drop of dye solution onto that. And the drop stays there, it sticks. And it stays there for exactly the same reason that the hairy-tongued bat has a hairy tongue, because it absorbs the nectar into the little gaps between the pillars. And it uses capillary action, basically, between the little pillars. And so the fringes on the hairy-tongued bat's tongue absorb the nectar the same way that the dye solution sticks on the, net, the diamond needles. So it works the same way. And that would work as a laser, and in fact it shows a threshold, and it does all of the same things. And just to show you another image of what those diamond needles look like, they really do look like nano needles, and they're different, subtle differences in the treatment conditions give you different heights and different particle densities, but they're random. And so it was kind of interesting trying to characterise how they behaved and how they affected the behaviour of the laser in terms of the density of the particles and the, and the heights and the aspect ratios. So now I want to go to something where we used a random laser and we actually used it in an application because so far it's been kind of cute and it's been interesting, but why would you bother? 
And so here's an argument why you might bother. So I start by explaining to you about gold nanoparticles. So gold nanoparticles, when you excite them with light, you <coughs> excite the electrons in the gold and they um, concentrate on the surface of the gold nanoparticles. They create high electric fields just on the surface. And those high electric fields interact with the molecules in the surrounding liquid, such as the fluorescent dye molecules. And you get what's called a local surplused surface plasmon resonance. So a surface plasmon is an optical electronic combined excitation. It is a really weird object. But it is an excitation that occurs just on the surface of a metal and a dielectric. And the, and the fields are very concentrated in these regions. So you can see that from this pattern here. Here's a perfectly spherical gold particle. And this is the resonance that occurs around that particle. The fields are really concentrated just on the surface. So um, this is a graph done with silver, not gold. But I have to admit, silver and gold are very similar things. If I put silver into a random laser, the um, threshold goes right down. So the output of the silver random laser is way higher compared with the, the dielectric random laser. So silver really enhances the performance of the random laser. It makes it much easier to make it work and it enhances the emission. And <coughs> gold does basically the same thing. So we put gold and laser dye, uh, rhodamine dye, into a solution. And we can see the um, overlap of the absorption or the extinction of the gold and the absorption of the rhodamine 6G, but also the gold overlaps with the emission of the dye. And so there is a, transit, a transfer of energy from the gold particles to the dye molecules based on that sort of resonance overlap. And that enhances the performance of the dye. Now I bring in a substance called dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter. Everybody's got it in their brain. Um, it's that molecule there. And it's, a, it's, it's at quite low concentrations. It, it occurs at like um, 10 nanomolar concentrations in your, in your cerebrospinal fluid. But it's a really important transmitter. And it is di the level of dopamine goes low in the presence of uh, during Parkinson's disease. So I wouldn't use the presence of dopamine as a diagnostic of Parkinson's disease, but it is quite important in the treatment of Parkinson's disease to monitor that level of dopamine because that can help the um, doctor to understand whether that particular treatment is working as effectively as it might. So it's not so much that it diagnoses Parkinson's, but it's helpful in understanding how the treatment is progressing. Now, <coughs> dopamine is interesting because it's got a fairly polarizable property. It's sort of, um, it's got, it's not charged, but it's got a sort of polarizable property. So it, it does react with the gold particles chemically. And when you put gold particles in solution and you add dopamine, depending on the amount of dopamine you add, the color changes. It looks like this. So you've got a colorimetric way of measuring the dopamine concentration just by the presence of dopamine and gold. So what's actually happening here? The shift in the spectrum is occurring around about that level, which is about 5 by 10 to minus 4 molar. And it's looking like it goes from, this is supposed to be blue, but it looks a bit transparent, but it goes from bluish to red. What goes on when you do that? So when you do that, what you're actually doing is making the gold particles glue together. The dopamine actually makes the particles aggregate. When the particles aggregate, they behave as if they're bigger. Now remember I said to you at the beginning, the size of the particles changes their color. This is what we're seeing. We're actually seeing effectively the dopamine making the particles stick together and then that changes their color and then they behave differently when they've stuck together, when they've aggregated. And this is what's shown here. You've got um, increasing dopamine from zero to some quite high value. And 
the particles are effectively separated, but then they start gluing together more and more and more. And by the time you get to here, you've got really large aggregations of particles. That then changes the properties of the random laser because these are quite large aggregations of particles. So when I put a random laser, when I put these particles aggregated into this dye solution with the dopamine and the gold, that affects the way they behave and they start to aggregate more or less. And so that affects the way the, la the random laser behaves. And that is what we can see here. We can actually see the emission spectrum changes as a function of concentration. And we can see, for example, that we can plot the threshold over five orders of magnitude of dopamine concentration with a linear um, performance. So that looks really good. And it's very sensitive. It goes down to the 10 millimolar, 10 nanomolar level, whereas the colorimetric one went to about 0.1 millimolar. However, I need about a mil of solution to do this. And you're not going to be able to get a mil of solution of cerebrospinal fluid from your average patient. This is not that high. So we need to make it smaller. And so this is what we've done here. We've actually taken a hollow core fiber, an optical fiber, and we've worked out that we can get um, a picoliter sample volume into the core of that fiber. We can guide the excitation light down the fiber, and we can still see the random laser behavior, but only in 1D, because it's only guided down the fiber. And so we've been able to miniaturize the whole sample assembly and make it about 100 times more efficient at the same time. So that's where we're at now. So we've, we've been able to adapt our initial measurements make the sample size so much smaller by confining it within the fiber. And I conclude by saying that nanoparticles are intriguing proper, um, little objects. Um, in Texas, they say somebody's all had no cattle. And these are all surface in their bulk. So um, they can reflect, they can scatter, they can absorb, and they can emit light, which is what I'm interested in. Um, they can be useful for imaging and they can also be used for sensing at really nanomolar concentrations. And so it's the collective effect that I'm using in the random lasers to make that work. And finally, I want to acknowledge all of the um, students and collaborators who worked on this work. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, how many of you have heard about mathematics as a universal language? Has anyone heard that? Yep, we, 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 we've all heard that. Yes, yeah, yeah we agree with that. Um, the reason I'm here to tell today in the Frontiers of Science Forum is to tell you that that's, I, I don't believe in that. And the reason I don't believe in that is because if you wind back the clock and go way back in time about 4,000 years ago, you see that if you have different beliefs about mathematics, you get different things. So, and we're only just starting to discover this now. It's um, often said, but like Sophie Germain has, it happens, that algebra, oh, cool. <laughs> tiring, algebra, <laughs> <laughs> algebra is but written geometry and geometry is but figured algebra. They're just two sides of the same coin. So, what happens if you change your algebra? What happens if you change your arithmetic? Well, you get different things. Uh, in ancient Mesopotamia, that's uh, this region over here, um, about 4,000 years ago, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, um, Mesopotamian culture existed for about 1,500 years. Uh, this is known as the cradle of civilization, by the way. So we have many, uh, many wonderful things coming out of this period. The world's first postal service uh, was invented here. The world's uh, first stringed instrument is traced back to here. Written language traced back to here. And mathematics, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, mathematics is said to have begun here. Um, this, just for some context, this is a time when people are just starting to come out of uh, you know, nomadic lifestyles. They've just discovered agriculture, another one of their achievements. And, uh, and they start to live in cities. 
which has surrounded uh, a temple that ministers the city and owns all the land. And, uh, and people start farming that land in, this, in a uh, kind of agricultural sense. So here you have a nice artistic rendition of what's going on. You have very fertile areas, rivers, temples, palaces, uh, walls. You've all heard of the walls of Babylon and the hanging gardens of Babylon. That's the kind of stuff we're talking about. Um, now, one of the wonderful things about this is, um, is their written records. You've all heard of the Great Pyramids of Egypt. They're kind of hard to ignore. You have these massive, wonderful structures just sitting in the desert. And, be, and they indicate the kind of sophistication of the culture that was there. But you have very little of their writing because they wrote on papyrus, and of course, papyrus deteriorates quite rap rapidly. Um, in Mesopotamia, you have the opposite. They built everything out of clay, massive structures out of clay, massive palaces out of clay. You have, uh, there, there's, there's step temples or ziggurats still, in, still exist. You know, there's one at Perth, um, which has been restored. Um, the important thing is, they wrote on clay. Now, when the temples and sorry, when the cities uh, became destroyed through war or famine or drought, the um, the cities would collapse and the buildings would collapse with all the documents inside. Them. And then people would come along and, uh, and once the war was over, all the famine or the war was over, all the waters would return. They just built a new city on the old city. And so, in the deserts of one day Iraq, you have these piles of clay, which are just city built on city, built on city, built on city for hundreds of years. Within these piles of clay hundreds of thousands of clay documents. Um, most of them are untranslated. A fair slab of them are in the British Museum, but also in other museums around the world, private collections, libraries, that kind of stuff. And we are only now, what well, we've been reading them for about 100 years, we've still got so many, there's, there's always new tablets to read, always new things to discover. We're going to be talking about one of those tablets today. So, let's... Um, I'm particularly interested in the mathematical tablets. So let's talk about the people who did mathematics back then. They're called scribes. Scribes are your highly numerate uh, professional administrators. Normally you send your, if you're lucky, you send your children to scribal school from about the, uh, the age of five where they learn to write words and do mathematics. These people grow up to be the administrators of the local temple. Uh, some of them become the equivalent of accountants, engineers building canals. Some of them, the ones we will talk about today, become surveyors. Now, being a surveyor is top-notch scribal achievement. You see this uh, relief here. This is a uh, this is a deity. Uh, this this fellow over here, he's a king. He's, you can tell by his luscious beard, he's got a lot of status, and he's pouring a libation into the pot plant. You can uh, you change my shadow. You can see that he's pouring something in there and splashing out to the sides. Um, and this other person, this other person over here, he's a Babylonian god. He's very pleased by this offering, and he's handing over to the king these symbols of uh, kingship, namely the tools of the surveyor, the reed, which is that looky thing down there, and the measuring rod. These represent a fair measurement amongst the people. This is why the king gets. Uh, the tools, these tools. Um, so surveyors, very highly regarded people, professionals, um, and very, very numerate. What were they doing? Well, they were measuring land. Now, initially, in the, in the very early stages, all the land's owned by the gods anyway. So you don't really need to be that uh, fancy about it. You measure, you measure the land and you say, oh, so it's about that big. And, uh, and that's good enough, because you all you want to do is measure the harvest to know if you have enough food to feed everyone that day, or that season. Um, as time goes on, things change. In the period, say, between 1900 to 1600 BC, you have the, uh, what's known as the Old Babylonian period, which is a, a real golden age of rapid scientific and cultural development. Among those scientific and cultural developments are the idea that you can own land privately. Not the gods owning your land, your land, my land. And when you have people owning land privately, you have neighborly disputes. Because I claim those, uh, those date palms, and you might also claim those date palms, and so what do they do? They send the surveyor. And the surveyor is the, the kind of the, the arbiter of justice, and they say, the line is here, and the date palms are on that side, so you own them and I have to be quiet about 
what's remarkable at this time, is they've been surveying this whole time, measuring land um, for hundreds of years, but just public land or temple land. About this time, land measurement becomes super accurate. Super accurate. They don't just say, no, nah, that's about a right angle. No, they get perfect right angles. Geometrically perfect right angles. How? Remember, your surveyor's got a rope, a rod, and an understanding of mathematics. That's it. No fancy lasers, no fancy surveying tools. That's what they've got. How can you make a right angle out of that? Um, when I was, uh, my family have a, a farm on the south coast, and I'm the second son, so I get all the awful jobs. Um, so my brother says, "Build Daniel, build a fence here, perpendicular to this fence. So he gives me the, the barbed wire and the tools, and so I go off and make a fence. But um, being scientifically inclined, I start making the fence and realize, mm, no, 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 that's not perfectly right. I need to tear it down, start again. And I do that again, and I get a bit further along and I realize, oh gee, this is not right either. Tear it down, start again. Eventually my brother comes along and says, what have you been doing all this time? Where's the fence? And I say, but but I, it's not perfect. It's not a, it's not perpendicular. You said to make it perpendicular, and I can't. And he says, step aside, younger brother. He gets out his measuring tape and he measures three meters down one side of the fence, four meters that way, and then five meters that way, making a mathematically perfect right angle, because three squared plus four squared is five squared. It's perfect. Even I can't refuse the mathematical beauty and simplicity and perfection of, uh, of such a th uh, thing. Now, let's go to Istanbul. Um, in the Istanbul Archaeological Museum, you have a plan of a field. This one. It's a very nice little tablet that some 4,000-year-old surveyor has gone out and there's a, it's a private subdivision of land. This area up here is kind of marshy. And they want to, and it's being sold over here. That region is being that left hand, my, your left, that left hand side is being sold. And everything is perfect. Everything is a perfect right angle. Why? Pythagorean triples, but not the three, four, five. Instead, they're using the five, twelve, thirteen Pythagorean triple and the eight, fifteen, seventeen Pythagorean triple. Um, they're, placed, they're placed at strategic locations, by the way, so you get two of them along this boundary where that's the new boundary being made, and two of them along here, one adjacent to that, and again, where the marshy region is, um, the boundary between where it's marshy and not. Um, amazing. Now, there's something very special about those triples. Not every Pythagorean triple is useful to a Babylonian. There's something that makes those two happen or useful, and not others. And they, um, it's, because, it's because, geometrically, some of them can be stretched to match the size of the field. You see these, these things have been stretched to match a region, stretched along here to match a, a perhaps a canal or something like that. Some of them can be stretched and some of them cannot. To understand what's going on, we need to think like a scribe. Here's a exercise. So young scribes at scribal school before they get to become surveyors get uh, lots of training. Here's an example of an educational text. Um, you can see it's written on clay. It survives basically in pristine condition for 4,000 years until someone digs it up and puts it in a private collection in um, Stockholm, in this case. This is a collection of exercises. The, one, the exercise is, in this case, a student is given five rectangles and asked to find one to stretch so that its diagonal becomes seven. So you can imagine the kind of scenario we have over here, the scenario over here. You want to stretch a rectangle and make its diagonal match, say, that length. But the length is seven in the exercise. You're given five candidate rectangles to choose from. Their diagonals are, we'll speak more about these numbers soon, 801, for now just think about it as eight, eight minutes, one second. 108, 105, 101, and 25. Now, that mathematically, in one language, 
you'd say you need to find the stretching factor so that the, you can stretch the rectangle up and its diagonal becomes 7. So you have to solve one of those equations. But only one of those equations can be solved. In modern mathematics, you can solve all of them. Get your computer out, uh, crunch the numbers, find out what x is. In Mesopotamia, only one of them has a solution. First, we must, to, to understand what they're doing here, we must, must think like a scribe thinks. So you're, about to, you're all about to become like young trainee scribes. Um, here's what their writing looks like. I'm only going to teach you two, two symbols. Um, the symbol, like this horizontal symbol, it's, uh, it's made with a, a stylus pressed into, pressed into clay, by the way, wet clay. This one here, this up and down, this kind of uh, vertical symbol means one. Uh, and you can, if you want two, you just put it twice. So two, two of those symbols means two, three, four, five, and so on, all the way up to nine. Uh, ten repetitions of that wasn't given as ten, it was written as a kind of sideways wedge. So you just angle your stylus slightly differently and that becomes a ten. And you can repeat that up to five times. So ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty. Those are the two symbols. A ten symbol and a one symbol. Uh, making tens and one by combining tens and ones, you can make what's known as the digits. Bigger units always come before smaller units, so the tens appear on the left, the ones on the right. And so you can make a number like 59 by just writing five clump, clumped up tens and nine clumped up ones. Um, how do you how do you write zero in this? You, 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 or it's already zero. Yeah, no zeros, and no tens and no ones is exactly how you write zero. Um, it's wonderfully literal. Um, uh, and what happens when you want to write, write something bigger than 60? Well, you go back to one. It's exactly the same symbol used for one, but appears on the right uh, because you have to go biggest to smallest. So if you, want, if you want something like 73, you'd write that as 1, as in 60, and then 10, and then 3, uh, like so. And then think about it as minutes, at, 73 minutes is, what is it? 1 minute and, sorry, 73 seconds is 1 minute and 13 seconds, is the, is the kind of way to think about it. Okay, so all pretty, pretty standard so far. It looks pretty, pretty normal. We can all think that's more or less equivalent to what we do, um, except except that it's not quite true. Blank space means zero, and there's no such thing as a decimal point. They don't believe in decimal point. And, and, cut to, and, and just blank space could mean zero. So that, that changes the kind of mathematics that you have. Um, so for example, certain numbers such as 30 and two are reciprocals of one another. Because 30, uh, two times 30 is one. Okay, we might say it's 60, but they would just say it's 1. 2 times 30, 2, two is, uh, 30 is half now, and a 30th is 2 now. Things are starting to get different. In fact, scribes would know a whole bunch of numbers, we call them reciprocal pairs. So 2 and 30 would be the first one, because uh, 2 times 30 is 1, but you also have 3 times 20 is 1, so a third of an hour is 20 minutes, or a quarter of an hour is 15 minutes. All these kinds of equivalences crop up. Uh, an eighth of an hour, 7 minutes, 30 seconds. Some, uh, some numbers that are on this list, they're, they're called reg the numbers on this list are called regular, meaning that they have reciprocals. Numbers kind of between these things like the, that cheeky number between 6 and 8 is not on this list. That's because it doesn't have a reciprocal. 7 does not have a reciprocal in the system. Ah, there it is again. Excellent. 7, no reciprocal. When the Mesopotamians saw the number 7 and said, divide by 7, they'd say, no, you cannot divide by 7. And they'd just move on, get on with their lives. Um, so sevens, a 7 is not a thing. Uh, neither are numbers like 1 over, well, 108, you might think of that as 68. 
uh, 1 over 165 down there, or 1 over 61. Nope, don't exist. We can't do that in our system. Okay, now, so we don't believe in zero, we don't believe in decimal point, we don't believe in one seventh anymore. Um, things get trickier. Consider, for instance, that 42 times 10 is 7 now in this system. You might uh, like to think that's 7 with some zeros at the end, but they don't believe in the zeros at the end and they don't believe in decimal points. So, does, well, hang on a second, 42 times 10 is 7, so, so 7, I thought 7 was prime, now 7 is a multiple of 10. Oh dear, oh dear, we just broke mathematics. N no, no, you're just applying a mathematical theorem that doesn't belong here. The concept, our usual concept of multiple and factor doesn't work here. Now, the Mesopotamians did understand multiples and factors, just differently. Um, in decimal, it's really easy to tell when a number has a multi is a multiple of 2 or has a factor of 2. You just look at the final digit. If it's 2, 4, 6, 8, or 0, then it's a multiple of 2. Similarly with 5. It's, if it ends in 5 or 0, it's a multiple of 5. Great. Easy. Easy. To, that, that's much easier than... Um, th those ones are easy. Mesopotamians believed in pretty much that, but in base 60. So they have loads of factors they can use. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, not 7, uh, 10, 12, 15, 20, and 30. If your final digit ends in a multiple of one of those, boom, you can take that factor out. So you can say something happily like 7. No, that's not a factor of 10 because it doesn't have one of the prescribed endings of 10. It should end in a 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50. Those multiples of 10s have that final digit. We don't believe in trailing zero, so I'll just chop that one off. So it's really easy to see when things have factors, right? And we'll just wrap all that information up as a, as a theorem. A number is regular, or as in has a reciprocal, when all its factors are regular. So, is 3 a factor of 245? Well, yes, if you, uh, 3 will divide just that bit, the 45. And so it does divide it. Does that mean 245 is regular? Well, you have to look at all the factors. And 245 factorizes as 3 times 5 times 11, and that 11 will snoop you. So no, it's not going to be uh, regular. No, and that means no, it does not have a reciprocal. Right, I'm almost done. Right. Coming back to our, our problem now, this is the student's problem about finding a suitable <coughs> rectangle so that they can have seven as a diagonal, which is what their teacher told them to do. Let's go through the, part, the bits. H01 is irregular. How do I know that? It's got no factors at all. One, the final digit. It's not a multiple of two, it's not a multiple of three, it's not a multiple of any of those things. So 801, whatever its factorization is, don't care. It's not going to be regular at all. Uh, 108, that one's on the standard table. I mean, that, that happens to be 4 times 17. They don't care about that. No, no reciprocal. Just it's, on the it's not on the table. No, no reciprocal. 105, 101, no reciprocal. 25, 25's great. We can work with 25. Um, and you can so solve it, and x is just 16.48. It's in 16 minutes, 48 seconds. Oh, right, so wrapping up. Um, because of their quirks of their arithmetical system. They have a different understanding of factor, they have a different understanding of multiple, they don't believe in zero, and they don't believe in decimal points, it means that only some Pythagorean triples are useful to them, namely those ones. That's why the, those top four appear in Svein text, but things like 20, 21, 29, that's not very useful to them. 20 is okay, but the 21 and 29 are rubbish. Can't, you just can't work with them, you can't stretch them. Um, Ancient cultures, including ancient Indian culture, used these Pythagorean triples to create perpendicular lines well before Pythagoras came along, um, like a thousand years before he came along. And the last two are kind of pleasant. It's that mathematics is not universal. If aliens came down from outer space, we couldn't talk mathematics with them. No, we can barely understand what happened in our, in our own, uh, for humans 4,000 years ago. It's, it's so different just by passage of time. 
even co even fundamental concepts like integer depend on your uh, cultural background. And something I like to wonder is what would the world be like if they had continued those uh, those Mesopotam Mesopotamian mathematical traditions? What kind of science would we have if we took that path? We, if we believe in things like decimal points, we get this kind of mathematics and this kind of geometry in science. What if we don't? What if numbers float? What would, uh, what would science be like if we took that branch? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, that's, that's the end of the talk. So, um, yes, good timing. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Well, good evening. Thank you for the, the very kind introduction. What I want to do in the next 25 minutes or so is tell you a bit about macroscopy and how we use microscopy to look at the, the smallest details that define the processes of life. I brought a, I brought a prop. Not sure whether this is visible, but this is uh, a microscope. This is a pretty perfect replica of the very first microscope that was made by Anthony von Leeuwenhoek, coming from the same country as Sudan from, the Netherlands. And he um, was a textile merchant, and he was very interested in his business, obviously. And he wanted to better understand how he could apply quality control of the limits that he produced in, in Holland. So he, uh, he developed this microscope, um, and it's quite cool actually. It's a bit of a, a, bit of a sheet of metal, it's teeny tiny, there's a teeny tiny lens there. That is essentially molten glass that he uh, melted in a candle and he solidified it into teeny tiny, medium sized droplets of glass that he put in the, in the metal sheet and he could put their objects on top of it. And by holding the microscope almost up into his eye, he could achieve magnifications of uh, close to 100 times. It's quite amazing. This was a few hundred years ago and he um, still primarily focused on making a living. Uh, making his linens and selling his textiles, he then started to use his microscopy in his spare time, I imagine, to look at all the stuff around him. Uh, for example, taking pond water, he was the one who discovered there's a lot of life down there, with smaller and smaller length scales. So using his microscope, he could see stuff that, uh, that was down to the level of, uh, of several tens of micrometers. So you see some examples of drawings he made of organisms that he called uh, animal kills, which is already an interesting combination of animals and small stuff that we tend to call molecules now. And similarly, we, several hundred years later, are interested in exploring length scales, going bigger, that's not my field of science. Astronomers, for example, are interested in, s in the largest length scales of the universe, and we are interested in exploring the smallest length scales. So I want to tell you a few the bits of the work that we do using modern microscopy. So we've advanced a bit since the, the years of Anthony van Leeuwenhoek's microscope to look at molecules of DNA and proteins and understanding how these biological macromolecules play important roles in, uh, in life. In particular, I want to start with the basic principles of the genetic blueprint of life, the molecule of DNA. Every organism on the planet, you and I, bacteria, uh, pretty much everything, even, even viruses, uh, classes of viruses have DNA in them, double-stranded DNA, that uh, contains long and long stories consisting of the four letters of the DNA alphabet, A, C, G, and T, that essentially codes all the protein factors and other biological entities that are needed to do daily housekeeping to keep our cells happy and alive. What I'm personally interested in is the process that needs to take place if you have a cell that divides to give rise to two daughter cells, what then happens with the DNA content in the nucleus of the cell. It needs to be duplicated very precisely into two identical copies that can then be distributed into the two daughter cells that are being created by my cell division. And it's a process we call DNA replication. So what I'll tell you about is how we've developed microscopes 
that look at this process of DNA copying the DNA replication, even down to the single molecule. But just to give you a sense of scale, before I continue, this um, to give you the realization that in, in humans, human cells, we have two meters of DNA in every individual cell in our body. Typical cell size, depending on what tissue type you look at, is a few tens of micrometers to several hundreds of micrometers. Inside these cells we have nuclei. Those nuclei are 5 to 10 to 20 micrometers in, in size. And those contain, each and every single nucleus, contains 2 meters of DNA. It's all highly condensed and compacted. So you see uh, an electron microscopy image of the tip of a needle with on, on top of the needle a clump of, uh, of a couple of human cells. And again, imagine that each of these cells has two meters of DNA. And to give you a sense of scale, I'm going to walk you through a couple of numbers. I'm not using Mesopotamia on the net. I'm yeah. using the, the version that I'm used to. To give you a sense of scale involved in this DNA replication process. The amount of DNA replicated in a lifetime in our own body. So the first estimate that I need to make is to guesstimate, for lack of a better term, the number of cells in our body. It's roughly 100 trillion, 100 trillion cells in our body. Then the next question you need to ask, if you want to calculate the total amount of DNA replicated in our lifetime in our body, how often is every individual cell divided in the course of our lifetime? That's a tricky one. It depends a bit on the uh, on tissue type. If you take uh, your the lining of your stomach, for example, or I hesitate to say your hair follicles, they divide many, many times over during your lifetime. In some cases, that sort of stops at some point. Um, but that's uh, hundreds and hundreds of times. If you take uh, neuronal cells, that pretty much stops dividing when you reach the age of 20, 20, 25. Um, but the average is roughly 50 times. So an average cell divides 50 times of your lifetime. And as I said earlier, there's two meters of DNA per cell that you need to replicate. So if you multiply all these numbers, you will end up with the total amount of DNA that you replicate in your body over your lifetime. And it turns out to be 10,000 trillion meters of DNA, which is a big number. I'm not really good at big numbers. I always have difficulty. The moment you get more than a trillion, it's like, what does it even mean? It so happens that this is pretty much exactly as one light year. <laughs> a single person in their lifetime replicates a light year of DNA. And this process is all done by nanometer sized protein molecules that unwind the double helix and synthesize new DNA. At a speed and an accuracy that is unbelievably high. It's a light year after all, it's quite a bit. The accuracy is so high, it's actually quite amazing that two-thirds of us do not get cancer. I know this is a very uh, class half full kind of statement, <laughs> but it's amazing if you if you set it against that one light year of DNA that we need to replicate, it happens pretty much without mistakes. It's a bit of a lie. Mistakes are made, the cells have DNA repair pathways that will take on, take care of mistake, mistakes. But, but nonetheless, the, the typical replication process in human cells happens in an accuracy of roughly one mistake per one billion letters. That I think deserves a bit of time. <laughs> so what uh, we started developing in our lab uh, quite a while ago is uh, a new form of microscopy that allows you to visualize how this replication process works at the single molecule. Biochemists since the 50s of the last century have developed all kinds of tools to perform biochemistry on, for example, these processes like DNA replication. And we've come a long way in understanding how these DNA molecules are being replicated. And what you see on the, on the top left hand side there is an artist impression made by a very talented uh, molecular animator from Melbourne, Drew Berry from the WeHi, that visualizes, actually based on real structural data we have, how these protein molecules look like that unwind DNA, converting it from double-stranded DNA into single-stranded DNA, and converting the two single strands of DNA back into two copies of double-stranded DNA. 
and how the process might work based on biochemical data we have accumulated over the last 17 years, I would say. What I'll show you is how we're now able to visualize those processes, processes at the single molecule level. And as I'll try to convince you, looking at chemistry and biochemistry and chemical reactions at the single molecule level tells you actually way more than looking at a gazillion reactions in a, in a, in a, in a little tube, looking at the ensemble averaging level. And I'll tell you at the end a bit more about bacteria and how they replicate DNA and how we might all die because of antibiotic resistance. So I am sad to end this talk on a, on a bit of a negative note, but there's always hope because there's research. Um, as I said, we develop techniques to look at individual biochemical reactions, molecule by molecule. And these two pictures, I think, are the best indication of why that as an advantage. So this is a New York marathon. This is on top of one of the bridges in New York. And if you look at uh, an altitude of 50 or 100 meters, the only thing you will see is a pack of runners, tens of, tens of thousands of runners that sort of make their way to the city of New York. You'll be able to determine with high accuracy where the pack of runners are on average and how fast on average they're going to the city of New York. But you will not be able to see from a distance what those individual runners are doing. Importantly, you will not be able to see if an individual runner sometimes stops to take a break, get a glass of water, and, and get a bit of a rest. And this is really important in protein biochemistry, understanding those complex motions of these protein molecules. We need to be able to visualize what we call short-lived intermediate states. We need to be able to not just see the temporally averaged, but we need to be able to see when those proteins might transiently very briefly do something else than what they normally would do. That tells you a lot about how biochemical reactions work. I'll just show you one example of an experiment that we managed to do a while ago, and this is again related to this DNA replication. So we developed a technique in the lab where we take uh, DNA molecules, uh, in this case we use the DNA that we steal from a bacteriophage called Lambda, uh, the DNA is visualized over here, and bacteriophage is essentially a virus to infect some bacterium. And we take those DNA molecules, they're 60 micrometers in length, and we chemically change one end of the DNA so we can glue it to the top surface of a glass microscope cover slip. And the other end we uh, chemically modify so we can stick it to a little bead that has a diameter of 2.8 micrometers. We place all those DNA bead tethers at the surface of a microfluidic flow cell so we can apply an aqueous flow of solution where the Stokes drag force on the beads will apply a gradual stretching force so that the DNA molecules are very gently stretched out close to a parallel to the top surface of the, of the glass, almost comparable to a to boat anchored in a river that is flowing, so we pull the, the anchor taut. And what we then can do is we use microscopy to optical microscopy to visualize where those little beads are. We can pinpoint the centers with nanometer accuracy, and as a result, at a constant stretching force, we can measure length changes in the DNA that are down to a nanometer level and down to tens of milliseconds of time, time resolution. So we have an opportunity to look at a single DNA molecule and see how its length changes because of these proteins working on it. So we applied this to, uh, to a DNA replication complex that consists of multiple proteins that are all working hand in hand to support this replication process, unwinding the DNA, synthesizing new DNA. There's all kinds of boring accessory proteins that do important jobs in this process, keeping the whole complex together. And one example I think is visualized here really powerfully why you want to do these single molecule experiments. It was hypothesized tens of years ago that you actually have a little loop in the DNA there that is created, growing and resolved during this process. The little molecular animation I showed you before already showed you this little loop being, uh, being protruding out and, being, uh, and, and disappearing and over and over again. This has been hypothesized for decades. It actually is in undergraduate first year molecular textbooks. A lot of you probably remember this picture of what we call the replication loop and it has never been actually demonstrated because you really need to go down to single molecule experiments. On the right hand side, there's a graph that shows you how we measured the length of one individual DNA molecule as a function of time as you replicate it 
using these replication proteins, and indeed you see the graph going down gradually and stepping back up. Going down gradually, stepping back up as a direct experimental proof that these little loops indeed are there. Um, and again, because of the random stochastic nature, as we said, of these events, it will be impossible to observe those if you look at a, a gazillion reactions at the same time in a tube. I want to switch gears here a bit, then I'll come back to the replication story. I want to talk about uh, this young man, Alexander Fleming. He was a microbiologist interested in how uh, microorganisms such as bacteria and yeast uh, behave. One reason why biologists always have used microorganisms to study biological processes is that they act as model organisms. Um, a Nobel laureate, uh, Jacques Renaud, at some point said, if you understand E. coli, which is a bacterium, you understand an elephant, which in many ways is true. Bacteria have processes at the molecular level that are very similar to what we have in our bodies. So biologists often use simple model organisms like bacteria to understand how things happen inside us. So Alexander Fleming was one of those microbiologists. So he... Uh, was actually known to run a pretty messy lab. Work, health, and safety wasn't really a thing back then. He had this petri dishes piled left and right in his lab. And at some point, he went on a family vacation, and he had a, a couple of uh, petri dishes piled up in the, in the windowsill. And after two or three weeks, he came back, and he realized that his bacterial plates had spots on them that were completely cleared of bacteria. Something had killed these bacterial bacteria. And in these spots, there were little, little spots of fungal organisms. So something weird happened, happened where he had fungi that apparently had killed off his bacteria. So he, of course, discovered penicillin, the first human discovered antibiotic, as a small molecule that can quite effectively kill <coughs> bacteria. As a, as a side note, uh, the story goes that he said, when he saw this, when he came back from his vacation, and he looked at his plate, holding it up against the light, he said, hmm, that's funny. And I think this is an important lesson, because a lot of people think that scientists, when they discover things, they call out things like, Eureka! It's not. When somebody in the lab says, hmm, that's funny, then you should pay attention. That's when real exciting discoveries are about to happen. So antibiotics became then, in my view, uh, one of medicine's greatest triumphs. The first antibiotic penicillin was discovered by uh, Fleming in the 30s. Um, it was very rapidly mass produced to be rolled out on the battlefields at the end of the Second World War in Europe and saved already hundreds of thousands of lives in the Second World War preventing infections of, of war, inflicted war-induced war wounds. And since then, and the estimates vary, it's estimated that there are 100 million lives have been saved since the Second World War because of antibiotics. I think that's a remarkable success story. However, things are not going so well anymore. Because of a phenomenon called antibiotic resistance, where bacteria, bacterial infections, have evolved to become insensitive to the antibiotics that we clinically prescribe. More and more bacterial infections that used to be 20, 30 years ago easily treatable are now becoming a problem. And this is something that you might have heard or even experienced yourself. UTIs are a great example. UTIs in Australia represent 2% of all GP visits. It's a very common thing, especially amongst women. Um, and more often than not, I would argue, the first antibiotic script that's being prescribed by the GP often doesn't really work anymore because of the many of the, uh, of the canonical UTI infections have become resistant to first-line antibiotics. So you need to get a second script. The infection in the meantime can get out of control. People will show up at ED or admitted to hospital. It's a massive burden on our healthcare system and mortality rates are going up because of it. So there's a... Uh, a landmark report that was published by Jim O'Neill a few years ago in the UK. Jim O'Neill used to be chairman of Goldman Sachs. Uh, he's a health economist by training. So he was an interesting person to pick uh, 
as a as a, as a person to lead a panel to do an assessment of the potential future impact of antimicrobial resistance because we both looked at clinical implications but also at health economics implications because he built his career out of money. And he uh, and, his, and his colleagues forecast that by 2050, if we don't act now, fixing this problem of, of antimicrobial resistance, we will have likely 10 million deaths globally per year because of AMR, because of antimicrobial resistance. That's more than currently pass away because of cancer or cardiovascular diseases. It's going to be a massive problem. And being a health economist, he forecasts that by 2050, if we don't do anything now, we will have a loss of 100 trillion US dollars in productivity. Those are massive staggering numbers. When I look at COVID, and all the impact that COVID has had on our society, I often think of COVID as the train that's approaching extremely fast. I think of AMR, antimicrobial resistance, as the oil tanker that is approaching more slowly, but will require more effort to divert it away. And I don't want to sound overly dramatic. This is the moment where the government should come in. But it's, it's really a big, a big concern. So people have done amazing jobs of dis discovering and developing new antibiotics. The problem is, and this graph is a, is a good visualization, very quickly after a new class of antibiotics is introduced in the clinic, you will see resistance in patients. The more you use an antibiotic, the quicker infections will become resistant and the quicker resistance will, resistant strains will become the dominant strain uh, in the community. So penicillin was discovered in 1928, first resistance identified in 1940, and it's only getting worse. You see that the later antibiotics is only a few years sitting in between the introduction of an antibiotic into the clinic and development of resistance. So we can't, as the Americans say, we can't simply keep kicking the can down the road. We really have to rethink our approach to, to, uh, to treatment of, uh, of bacterial infections, because whatever new antibiotic we develop, you will see resistance because bacteria are smarter than us. They evolve very quickly and they will evolve resistance the moment they're exposed to bacteria. So going back to my story about replication, we started out uh, a few years ago thinking about can we use DNA replication as a target, as a new drug target to develop new antibiotics. And that prompted us to do experiments on live bacterial cells and see inside live bacterial cells what happens to these replication molecules and other proteins that do things with DNA when you expose bacteria to antibiotics. So we started developing um, experimental evolution experiments that we can watch under the microscope and see in real time, time how bacteria evolve resistance against antibiotics, even down at the single molecule level. And I want to quickly show you this uh, figure is something similar you've probably seen uh, in high school biology or at uni. The top, the top line represents a couple of petri dishes and schematically depicts a large group of bacteria that are sensitive to antibiotics, except for one guy sitting there in the red who's resistant to antibiotics. So the classical view of evolution is that you apply antibiotics, and they say survival of the fittest, you kill all the bacteria that are sensitive to the antibiotics and then the ones left over that's resistant and that will then become dominant in the population. That's not quite correct. That happens, but what really is happening with bacteria as the bottom line, you have an entirely sensitive population of bacteria and the moment you start applying antibiotics, they will upregulate, they will kick in molecular pathways that will cause mutations in the DNA and it will fast forward the evolutionary process for the bacteria to become resistant. So it's the application of antibiotics that drives the evolution of resistance. And I'm certainly not saying that you shouldn't listen to the doctor and take your antibiotics when you need to, because you have to. It is still one of the most clinically successful classes of drugs, but as a society, we are overusing antibiotics in human healthcare, in agriculture, and that together is providing a driving force for these bacteria to evolve uh, resistance. I want to finish up because I'm running out of time, but just giving you one example of these experimental evolution experiments. So this is the scary part. 
There's one thing you remember from my presentation, it's this slide. So I'll quickly talk you through this. So, so these are bacteria, the bright stuff of bacteria. We have them fluorescently labeled, so they give light on the microscope. And we, we have two flow channels, one sitting here on the left and one at the right. This is a flow channel where you have bacteria growing. There's no antibiotic. They grow, they eat their food in the medium, and then they start to move towards areas with new food. And that's sitting there in the new channel that is connected to the old one with teeny tiny micro channels through which these bacteria can swim to the region with new food. But the new area on the right hand side has antibiotic. So the bacteria have only one choice, go where the food is, but that's also the region where the antibiotic is. This is a population that's completely sensitive to the antibiotic, so they should not be able to grow into the new region with antibiotic. But you see there in the channel on the right hand side, on the left and moving, and blown up there on the right hand side, is that these bacteria grow into the new region, they have a tough time because it's antibiotic, but all of a sudden, one bacterium will find the right mutation to become resistant, and you see a population explosion. And that's a process completely induced by the presence of antibiotics. So this is the last slide to show you the fancy movie. We are now in the process of observing these processes at the single molecule level inside living bacterial cells because we want to understand from a molecular point of view what are the DNA repair and replication processes involved with this rapid forward evolution process, trying to connect the molecular to what we say the phenotypical, seeing these bacteria change and understanding at the molecular level how that works. So I'll stop there because I really ran out of time. <coughs> um, we set up a beautiful new institute in Wollongong. We have a nice shiny new building with lots of cool microscopes. So when you're around, I invite you to come over. And of course, I really want to thank all the amazing people uh, with whom we've done all this work, wonderful students and collaborators. And uh, thank you for your attention. and also for the invitation to represent chemistry, I guess, here today. Uh, my name is Marcus and I'm a polymer chemist and I work at the University of Sydney. The way I've structured this talk today is um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of polymers and then I'll show you a bit of research results from, from my group and then at the end I want to have a, an outlook of what's happening in the next 100 years in, in our field. <laughs> well, i try to, nobody has a crystal ball, I guess. Um, so polymers. Um, have been around for a long time and we have actually been working with them knowingly or better unknowingly for a very long time. So the earliest examples that sort of I can find that are documented is um, plastics made from casein. So dating back all the way to 1530, so it's Bartholomeus Schubinger and um, Wolfgang Seidel, they exchanged a recipe that stated, uh, if you follow my instructions precisely, you can um, shape, form anything, cups, metals, anything you desire. What they were working with, which I assume they wouldn't have known at that time, is uh, they produced gallolis, so milkstone. So through the excessive heating of milk, you start to cross-link your milk proteins, and you get a horn-like material. If you go to Austria and Vienna, you might still find some doorbells, um, like the ones seen here, uh, on, on houses there. So it's a very um, sturdy and durable material. If we then fast forward a few hundred years, uh, I want to introduce Henri brun and he was interested in polysaccharides. So, um, Nowadays, of course, we know what polysaccharides are. He discovered them. He, he discovered pectin in particular, a very important biopolymer found in fruits uh, for preserving uh, food, so jellies, marmalades, etc. But again, I would say he would not have known that he was working actually with a polymer. The last example I want to show is um, Charles Goodyear and Thomas Hancock. Those two names probably ring a bell. They ended up forming very successful companies. And the reason why I picked this is because it's a bit different now to the sort of early curiosity work of the other two examples. This is now engineers and, and chemists actually getting excited about new materials that are found, in this case, in nature. So caocho, um, Indian rubber from, uh, from the tiri tree. If you take that sap and if, if you vulcanize, uh, vulcanize it, so you know, treat it with sulfur, you actually start to cross link it and you form rubber. And of course, these two names go hand in hand with, with the tire companies. So they, they really discovered or patented independently, actually, um, uh, the way we can make rubber. So engineers are now starting to get interested in, in that material. So what's that, that new material? Well, the new material is, is polymers, or as Staudinger coined it, macromolecules. 
So Staudinger is credited in today, um, as sort of the founder of, of polymer science, really. Um, he postulated back in the 1920s <coughs> that polymers are not just aggregates of small molecules. They are, in fact, large molecules that are held together by just ordinary covalent bonds. It's a statement that doesn't sound very radical today, but actually faced quite a bit of opposition, including from, from um, chemistry Nobel laureates such as Wieland, who wrote to him, essentially calling him a sloppy chemist and he doesn't know how to purify his material. <laughs> and um, Staudinger eventually went on to win the Nobel Prize in Chemistry as well in 1953, exactly for the discovery that macromolecules exist and also their importance for, for protein in science and so on. So it was a very um, crucial figure, in at least in my field. That's also why last year we had the 100 years anniversary, um, 2020, basically 100 years since a seminal work published 1920 about uh, polymerization. And he co coined the term macromolecule, so large molecule. And polymer is, is, is essentially a synonym for that. So since Staudinger, he really opened uh, our eyes to the world of polymers. So polymers are everywhere. Anything that you touch, anything that you see, probably contains some, in, in one form or another, a polymer, or as it often goes, a plastic. So we, we do actually currently live in the polymer age. So every age, Bronze Age, Stone Age, and the like, they are defined by a material class that has helped humankind reach the next level. At the moment, for plastics or polymers. And I want to illustrate on this slide here why that is the case. <coughs> if you think of the building blocks of, of, of a polymer or a macromolecule, so small molecules called monomers, and if you attach them together, you form these large molecules. But actually what you do in that process is you're forming very long chains, very long, long chain molecules. And what changes is the state of matter. You're actually going from a gas or a liquid to a solid. But also, you're changing um, properties such as a melting temperature to a more workable te uh, temperature that you could um, do fabrication in. So we're making now a new material class, essentially, by, by building up these long chain uh, molecules. So that's, that's sort of why they're interesting. This is a, a new material class. But also, and I want to show another intriguing example, hopefully, is that this is quite customizable. And I think this is really the success story of, of, of polymers in the last 100 years. So if we do an experiment here, we stick with the polyolefin, so in this case polyethylene, just carbons and hydrogens. And if we now extend the polymer chain, so let's start from a small molecule, just say methane, so CH4, and then we add more and more CH2 to build up a long chain molecule. What actually happens now in the state of matter and what happens to the use of that material? So obviously, if you have a gas, methane, um, ethane, uh, propane, it's a cooking gas, for example, so we can use them for cooking. If we extend them, we get gasoline or kerosene, make them a little bit longer, we get now grease or wax. But it becomes really interesting now when we are starting to polymerize this. So when we get polymers, long chain molecules, they interact differently with one another, and now we're getting tough plastic. So now we have repeating units of 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. So now all of a sudden, the material can be useful to make containers or bags, cling wrap, for example. If we make this even longer, we can make implants or bulletproof vests. And I think this is very intriguing. Just by being able to control the chain length, you can either make cling wrap to wrap your food in, or cling wrap you wrap yourself in to be protected in case you get shot. So I think it's quite uh, impressive material properties, simply by being able to control the molecular weight. So what does contemporary polymer science currently look like? I want to pick up on a theme that was, was already mentioned today, interdisciplinarity. So polymer science is, again, a truly interdisciplinary field. It needs chemistry to build new materials. It needs physics to understand how they act and behave. And then they provide a new material class for engineers and particularly nowadays also for nanotechnologists to, to work with. A lot of the polymers that we have currently, or uh, use currently, they actually use quite old chemistry. The chemistry was discovered 100 years ago. When, when we had the world wars, there were a lot of embargoes to natural resources, so na nations had to come up with synthetic ways to, to replace, for example, cotton. But the materials that we currently use, or the plastics that we currently use, they are still very modern material because engineering has made them better. We understand them better now, we can process them better. And why is it that engineering has improved the materials and not chemistry? It's really that there was a limiting factor here, and it was the control. It's very easy to make a polymer can make it by accident, but it's very difficult to control the polymer. When I'm, by control, I mean the uniformity, for example, the, uh, the branching, the 
the uh, composition. It's, it's, these are handles that are very difficult to control. But thanks to some discoveries 20, 25 years ago, including in Australia and CSIRO, we have now ways to precisely control polymer polymerizations. And so we can control things as the uniformity of chains, the composition, and the topology of the architecture. A lot of those discoveries are a little bit too recent um, and have not fully translated into, um, into industry yet. And so we still use a lot of our sort of, uh, commodity polymers, but this will come uh, in, in the future now. Just an, another quick example before I talk a bit more about um, the research that we are doing is why we should care about control. So let's look at the architecture. Let's stick with our poly, poly olefin, polyethylene. As I mentioned, only carbons and hydrogens. If we, make, if we make polyethylene to be a linear chain that has a bit of branching in it, we're producing lin, um, low density polyethylene. So if we use this polymer with this branching and fabricate a material out of it, the polymer chains cannot pack very closely together. So you're getting a low density material. So that's very useful for making see-through material, bags, cling wrap, for example. If we can, however, control the structure in a way that we omit those branches, then we get a more linear chain. We're making a high-density polyethylene. So now those chains can pack much closer together, and we're getting a high crystalline material, high-density material. And all of a sudden, the properties change dramatically. Now we can use this material to build tubing, so much more sturdy applications. So this is why we should care about precise control of, of, of what material that we're making, and particularly in this case, architecture. In architecture, I'm going to use as a segue into the research that I'm doing. Um, my group is quite interested in branch polymers, or polymers for peculiar architecture. And I want to start off by showing you this image here. <coughs> so what can you see here? I would say you see a lot of white words. If you look at the left, it's just an artistic representation of the right. The right is an atomic force microscopy image. And I'll tell you, each of those words is actually one molecule. It's one macromolecule, just one polymer. But you can see it with the atomic force microscope. If you now zoom into this, you would see a structure that looks like this. So each worm has a backbone, and from that backbone, polymer chains stick out. Okay? It's a very particular polymer architecture, I must admit, but this is something that we're interested in. Why are we interested in this? If you go back to linear polymers, no, no architecture now, put them in a solution, they will start to coil. They, they form a globule, in a sense. And this is interesting because if you have multiple chains, which you usually have in a, in a mixture, in a melt, they will start to entangle. Think of wet spaghetti or cooked spaghetti. It's difficult to, to pull them apart. They entangle. And this gives them a certain material property. But what we're interested in is now in this branching and what it does effect. So if you now attach side chains onto this polymer coil, and you get many onto them, so they have a crowding effect, they actually force the coil to stretch. So now you have A, no coil anymore, but more importantly, the polymer becomes bigger, and it actually becomes now a nanoparticle. So the size becomes bigger, and when I say nanoparticle, it's a keyword, so now we can do nanotechnology. And this is now termed not a polymer coil anymore, it's now a molecular brush. You find also words like this as a um, polymer bottle brush. And now maybe it makes sense why I had this image in the beginning on my title slide. Mm -hmm. So these are polymer bottle brushes. OK. <coughs> so now we have a nanoparticle. We can do nanotechnology. <coughs> One branch of nanotechnology is nanomedicine. So the use of nanotechnology to advance medicine or to overcome hurdles in medicine. And I want to pick an example of Say chemotherapy. Okay, so chemotherapy can be quite hard on the body. This is because we use small molecule drugs that are sometimes not very specific. They target obviously our tumor tissue, but they can also target our healthy tissue. So that makes it very strenuous on the body. But also because it is a small molecule drug, it gets cleared relatively quickly from the body, so you have to administer it over and over again. In nanomedicine, the concept basically is that we're using a carrier, a drug carrier, we encapsulate the drug inside the carrier. And then th that does uh, multiple things. One thing, it protects the drug from premature degradation, but also it will guide the drug to the area of action. So we can use that carrier to tell basically where, where to go and only affect tissue that, that we want to treat rather than having going have a body. On this slide here, I show you 
a very recent, just published a few weeks ago, um, overview from a, a leading group over in the in the U.S. discussing sort of um, a design parameter or, or how what type of nano carriers or drug carriers we can use. And two things will will strike here. One, it's not just about all about polymers, and that's okay for me. You can use different carriers as well. But the other thing is they are all spheres. They are all spherical. So in the last few decades, most of the studies that have been done in nanomedicine actually used spherical objects, small nanospheres. The reason for that is because they're very easy to make. But what we found out in recent years, let's say 10 years, 15 years, is that it's not just about the spherical shape or the, 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 the nano size that is important. Yes, there's other design parameters that are crucial. So it's the size, yes, but it's also the shape. So not the spheres, but maybe a rod shape or a disc shape. And then the, do we have a surface, a certain type of surface chemistry? Um, are we coated? Do we have ligands on the top, etc.? So these design parameters become now much more complex than just making a ball essentially and stick some drugs in it. And also it becomes important depending on what we want to target. Do we want to target tumors? Do we need to go through tumor tissue? Do we need to go through mucus, etc.? So in one way, having now this massive list of various design parameters that we need to understand how to guide our nanomedicines makes the whole problem complex. But as a scientist, you also look at this as an opportunity. In the future, we want to have personalized medicine. And uh, people are different. Um, we might have a different age when we have an illness. We might be at different stages of the, at an illness. So having more handles to actually tune the outcome of your delivery is actually a benefit. But of course, we need to first understand um, what each of those design parameters um, effect in the delivery. And this is sort of where the, blush, uh, the, the brush platform comes back uh, into play. A molecule brush essentially um, is, as I said, one polymer. So we can do all the chemistry that we, that we can do on molecules on it, but it also has part of the dimension. So it's inherently useful for nanotechnology. And the good thing is also that we can affect a lot of those design parameters independently. So we can have one brush platform or one nanoparticle platform where we can screen through all those design parameters and also see how combinations of those affect the outcome. So we can make material that has different size, it has different shape, it has different composition, it has different heterogeneity on the surface, for example, but also that it has different mechanical properties. So make a particle stiffer, make it softer, and see what, what happens. And what we are interested in is in tissue penetration, or tumor tissue penetration in particular. <coughs> so just an example, a few years ago, we made uh, molecular brushes of different shapes, spheres or ellipsoids, rods, and also filaments. You can see, again, atomic force microscopy up there, verifying the morphology of these materials. And then we um, exposed them to artificial tumors. So in this case, colon cancer cells, thousands of them stuck together to a sphere to make a really dense tissue. So what you can see basically in the, in, the, in the middle is that there's much more green color. And the color comes from our, from our brush particle. So the shape of a rod has much more association with our tumor tissue compared to a sphere or a filament. And again, if we are now cutting through the tumor, you can actually see again in the middle picture in H that the rod actually penetrates much deeper into the tissue than a sphere. And this is now also corroborated by other research groups in the, in the world that actually a rod shape in delivery is much more beneficial than a sphere. You can penetrate deeper into tissue than a sphere. So again, control is important to make these particles to actually understand the effect that they're having. That's another example. It's not published yet, but I find it interesting in the sense when we haven't fully understood it either. But we take a brush, so a nano rod, we make it soft or we make it hard or stiff, and then we actually, through a mechanical cue, we dictate the outcome um, in what region in the cell they're actually enriching or which uh, region in the cell that they're targeting. You have a soft nanorod, you're ending up in what's normally expected for nanoparticles in something called an endosome, so a compartment within the cytoplasm. But if you, if you rigidify this material, all of a sudden they're actually associated with the mitochondria. You want to understand this? It's not published yet. But what it tells us that we can actually use by controlling, again, our pla uh, part of the platform, uh, we can use a mechanical uh, parameter to actually uh, affect the outcome of what organelle or what, what part of the cells we are targeting. And again, thinking of personal me medicine, personalized medicine down the track, this could be quite important. 
a last example um, that I want to show is um, polymers with a peculiar architecture. You might argue the brush structure is already pretty extraordinary, but we found a way to actually put spikes onto this. So this is a cartoon. This is a uh, cryogenic transmission electron mi microscope, and you can see this elongated, uh, long-shaped um, uh, brushes, and they have this distinct black spikes in it. Maybe from a layman's point of view, maybe it's a bit um, difficult to, to see, but essentially this is sort of the spike architecture that we could generate. You can even play with the spike size, diameter, uh, lengths, etc. So it's a very uh, controlled way for us nowadays. Uh, when we did some, some other sort of uh, microscopy, um, which again might be a bit difficult to, to appreciate, but essentially look out for sort of fishbone structure. This is a tomography of a, of a uh, cryogenic um, uh, transmission electron microscope. But the reason why I tell you this is that I show you this image here. This is a biopolymer now with a peculiar architecture. Uh, on the top again, electron mi microscopy, on the bottom, atomic force microscopy. It's again a cylindrical object that is quite hairy or has the spikes sticking out. This is a proteoglycan aggregate. This is found in all of you, hopefully. It's in cartilage. In your articular cartilage, actually, you have lots of these biopolymer brushes, so to speak. Your cartilage actually compo is composed of a collagen network, and that is inf infiltrated by these brush-like architectures. And they help the healthy function of cartilage, but also help the load-bearing properties of your cartilage. So once they go, your cartilage goes, you might end up with osteoarthritis. Now, to treat osteoarthritis, there are multiple ways, very harsh ways, replace the joint. Or borrow ideas from tissue engineering and motivate maybe your body to regenerate cartilage. So one way of regenerating cartilage is to implant a gel that behaves in a way like cartilage it has cells in it that can regenerate the cartilage. So what we are aiming at doing here is really, we steal the idea from nature, look at natural cartilage tissue that has this collagen network with this brushed architecture, and then make synthetic versions of these brushes that hopefully not just mimic the structure but also the function of those. And then build up hydrogels that have cells in them that can be implanted to regenerate cartilage. This is early, early days, but uh, we managed to make several structural mimics. On the, on the left and right, you can see them. In the middle, you can see the natural part, the, the, the natural uh, proteoglycan aggregates. And at the bottom, you see on, on those pincers, you see a hypergel that we made. And I'll spare you all the mechanical testing, but by incorporating our brush material into the hypergel, we can significantly enhance uh, the mechanical properties and cells thrive in them as well. So always the next step is to, to look at how much cartilage we can reach. And obviously for the uh, purpose of presentation, I picked images over uh, sort of data. Okay, so this is sort of what I briefly wanted to show why we care about architecture and, and the, the, the funky architectures that we are making. In the last few minutes, uh, I want to just briefly talk about the next 100 years or um, the future of polymer science. I mentioned Staudinger before, the founder of polymer science, and he actually founded also a, a scientific journal called Macromolecular Chemistry and Physics, and it's still operating, and I'm on the International Advisory Board, and together with all the advisory board members uh, for the 100th uh, year anniversary, we wrote an open essay um, to look forward, where's our field going? And we surveyed, up, surveyed ourselves, and sort of these are three areas that we think is very, will, will be very important. So new synthesis, sustainability, and new properties and applications. And the way I want to do this now is basically just three slides. And I list a lot of bullet points. You can read to them if, if you like. But I'm only going to highlight a few that are already sort of emerging quite heavily in literature. So one is about new synthesis methods. <coughs> I mentioned we gained new control, including through Australian inventions and discoveries. But more control is better. So if you look at nature, they, they're making very well-defined sequence defined polymers, peptides, that then have, can fold up to have tertiary structure, etc., and become functional. So if we want to emulate nature, we need to get, a, get better in, in controlling the polymerization, and we want to make sequence-defined polymers, because this is the only way how we can truly emulate um, uh, natural processes with synthetic materials. And if we manage to do that, then we actually also 
can install or um, hide data in polymers. So we can then use polymers or plastics for data storage. So these are two fields that are quite heavily uh, emerging um, already, and there's a, there's a few other ones there. Uh, given the, the, the first presentation today by chief scientists, automated synthesis is also very big in polymer chemistry. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, robots are much better at synthesizing polymers than, than humans. But it frees up capacity to think about it. The next one was about functions. So if you think about polymers in everyday life, you would probably think about the function. When you wrap something with a cling wrap, you don't think about, oh, this is nice polyethylene. You think about the function that it does, affects your food or, or whatnot. So that bears then the questions, what functions do we need in the future? What polymers do we need to drive the new, new technologies? So what polymers are needed to inspire new technologies? Again, many bullet points and only a few highlights here. Printable electronics will, will be very big. 3D printing in general is very big. It's estimated that 10% of consumer products might be already 3D printed before 2030. Everything is meant to be smart nowadays, so automation, transport, smart household, etc. All of that needs tiny circuits and printable electronics. The other two things I want to highlight is energy storage. We all use batteries, but a lot of batteries are actually concepts from, from the 90s, the lithium-ion batteries. So polymer is actually pushing by in this area, making all polymer batteries much more lightweight, much more safe. And then there's other types of energy storage, mechanical storage, thermal storage, and polymers play a big role in that. And then the other thing is a bit sort of a dreamer's thing, but um, I mean, NASA and other uh, institutions showed us that it's possible. We can leave Earth and we maybe want to inhabit other planets, but we need materials to do that as well. So we need extreme polymers. Lightweight material that is extremely durable that actually can also withhold very harsh conditions, such as in outer space or on Mars or whatnot. Okay, and then finally, um, I want to finish off with sustainability. It's a very complex um, topic, and we pro probably could talk for, for hours on this. But facts are that our population is increasing, and that makes it even more challenging to overcome the grand challenges, climate change, food security, clean water, and the like. And again, polymer science does not have the solution for everything, but I think polymer science can um, lead a way, in, in a way, quite a bit, such as by providing membranes for clean water, for example, um, um, such as providing biodegradable polymers to, to combat some of the pollution issues that are associated with them. So sustainability, something that's very, um, I guess, uh, logic for chemistry is we need to find more environmentally friendly conditions in how we make material. It's not just chemistry, it's manufacturing in general, it's very energy consuming and energy comes, comes not done out of nowhere, right? Um, the other thing is, and this is where catalysis will be very important, so tiny nanoparticles as we heard today as well, green s synthesis routes, so catalysis will help us um, on the way. And then the other thing is plastic waste management. We are all aware nowadays that I think the polymer chemists of 100 years ago did a too good of a job, so the plastics are actually very durable and they last for a very long time and landfill is not the way they should go. So we need to rethink waste management, it should be a resource. And that will again require some chemistry to redesign the way how we make polymers. So can we fully break them down in a, in a circular way? Or can we repurpose some of the plastics that we have to make new types of material? But the reason why I say sustainability is complex because it's also driven by consumer behavior. We need policy change and we also need politicians, etc., to be doing new board. So scientists can lead the way, but everybody needs to get together. But I want to finish on a on a on a on a good thing. So Generally, if we identify problems, we have shown to overcome them. So biodegradable polymers are, for example, a, a direct measure to combat uh, microplastic pollution in oceans. Um, that's one way. And the other thing that is very emerging nowadays as well is the use of biomass. So algae, um, cellulose, so fantastic materials from nature that are renewable, that can grow again, and we can actually use them in a lot of advanced materials um, uh, fabrication nowadays. So not everything is bad, and I think the next time years can be uh, pretty good from a science point of view. Finally, I want to finish up with um, thanking uh, my, my group. I couldn't present everything that they're doing, but um, without them, uh, nothing would, would um, happen, and also the people who give us money to, to do the research, and um, thank you again for the kind of invitation.